Before we go, hi there. Welcome to the GMI Hub live on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us. It's going to be an incredible show tonight. We've got some amazing talent lined up for you tonight. Uh, Cheryl, come say hello. Hi, everyone. This is Cheryl from the Hub Live Online as well. We're so great to have uh, to have you come and join us um, and to have our three wonderful panelists as we discuss tonight the the music and arts in the ministry, whether it's a church ministry or a parachurch ministry. Mm -hmm. So let us introduce you to our first panelist. Um, all the way from Brampton, Ontario, we have Brian Como, who is here. He uh, was originally the singer, lead singer of the Imperials, um, and he is now a lead pastor at, at a church in, uh, in Brampton. So we welcome you, Brian. Um, all the way from Brampton. Yeah, and second yeah. up, we have Arthur Washnick. Arthur Washnick is a uh, production pastor, of uh, theater arts and music ministry at the Queensway Cathedral, as you know, the ch church in the Queensway down in the Etobicoke area, just before Toronto. And uh, he has uh, a, a background in theater arts and music and form performances and uh, being um, able to uh, direct many theatrical performances and a creator of music and phenomenal um, I think he's a very funny guy, but anyway, anyways, he's here, and uh, unless we have somebody else as well. And we have all the way from BC, West Kelowna, BC, we have Phil Spolstra, who has a wide variety of experience um, working at different, different churches from very small to very large uh, in different denominations, In and, and he's currently an associate pastor at a church called Emmanuel. Uh, Brian, I forgot to mention, yours was at Kennedy Road Tabernacle, and Phil is at Emmanuel. Um, it's just Emmanuel Church, Phil. Emmanuel Church, that's <laughs> wonderful. So, we, because of all your back, we just we're just so happy to have you all here. Thank you, gentlemen, for spending the time. Um, we gave you kind of a brief introduction, but um, whoever would like to go, go first, why don't you give us a little bit more information about your background and your experience? Phil, your picture is right in front of me right now. So how about you go first? Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. This is great. Uh, I'm recently new at Emmanuel Church in West Kelowna. I've been here for nine months. Previous to that, I was at Broadway Church in Vancouver for about 10 years as the associate pastor, also overseeing worship and the creative arts. One of the big parts of my portfolio there was a fantastic outreach Christmas ministry called the Vancouver Singing Christmas Tree. Um, it involved choir, orchestra, circus, acrobats, dancers. Uh, we had 20,000 people attend every year, and that was just an absolutely incredible uh, production to be a part of. Uh, I led worship there and oversaw a team of creative artists and technical artists. Previous to that, I was in St. Catharines at uh, Central Community Church. Uh, and then I started my ministry many years ago uh, in a small town, uh, Ottawa, a little town called Greeley. A wonderful congregation that took a chance on a young single kid out of Bible college, and that's why I began to cut my teeth as a worship leader. Wonderful, wonderful. Wow, you have a wide variety of experience there. Thank you for sharing. Arthur, can you share a little bit about your background? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I did not grow up in the church. I became a Christian in my last year of uh, theater school. Uh, I had an interest in uh, acting since I was a little boy. Went to an arts high school, Cothra Park in Mississauga, uh, studied acting, music, uh, dance. Went to University for Music Theater in Windsor. I, I switched to acting in my last year, became a, a Christian. Um, uh, in, my, in, my, in that last year, I auditioned, uh, first, first big audition downtown. I got cast in a big, uh, well-known Canadian theater company. Uh, which I had worked for my whole life, uh, what I thought I wanted more than anything. But at that same time, I was feeling this great emptiness. That same week, I became a Christian and sort of turned everything over to Jesus and walked away from that, thought I was done with the arts. But a couple months later, uh, was connected with music ministry that uh, ended up, I ended up traveling all over the world for many years with, in a small church doing music outreach. And also with a professional theater company called Brookstone Theater, a Christian theater company in Toronto that was doing incredible small productions uh, that were noticed by I now, you know, all the big media. Um, they had musicals nominated for Dora Awards, which is the Toronto Theater Awards, and was part of that community for a number of years, still connected with some of those folks. Um, and eventually, long story, but got to Queensway, uh, Church on the Queensway, 
where I oversee the productions there and involved with some of the music things. And uh, we do the Toronto Passion play uh, and a Christmas show that's seen by approximately 25,000 people every year. And we've started new missional things uh, where we were taking shows to smaller churches. So um, yeah, I've kind of always been dabbling. Since I've been a Christian for about 19 years, I've just always been connected to uh, ministry and the arts in some form. Wow, that is awesome. That is awesome. The 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 theater is going outside. That's a new thing for Queensway, isn't it? It is. That's something we started last summer. And uh, my heart has always kind of have been has been for small theater stuff because that was where I started. Mm -hmm. uh, we would it would be four artists, five artists uh, when we were part of Brookstone, and we would take these shows, tour them uh, sometimes for months, and you'd just go from small church to small church all over Ontario or out west. You, you know, they've gone out east. And I absolutely love that because I, for churches that uh, did not have the opportunity to have high level arts in their churches, we were kind of bringing that into their churches. They would in turn invite their entire community sometimes to come out. I mean, it, they were, it was just, it was a wonderful thing. So I wanna see that happen. I wanna see churches that have resources, bless the churches that don't and inspire them and help them to grow their own arts ministries. That's wonderful. Oh, that's awesome. Well, before we get carried away, we haven't heard from Brian. Brian, I haven't heard from you. Brian. Hey, I, I, want to hear, I want to hear more about Alton, man. I'm impressed already. <laughs> Brian, give us a little bit of your background. <laughs> well, I didn't grow up in a church. Grew up in Louisiana, near New Orleans area. Uh, high school area, except for Christ. And then I started traveling during when I got into college, really felt a call to ministry, to music. That, that was my degree in performance arts. And then um, traveled for a while, did a couple of albums and stuff. And then it took a different turn when I, I went to work for um, ministry for a guy by the name of Mike Warnke. He was a Christian comedian back when. And um, that kind of spurred it on to move to Nashville after that. Uh, went to a church in, in um Pensacola, Florida, Brownsville, Assembly of God for a while. Uh, did all the worship there and, and the Christian stuff. And then uh, went back to trap. You know, you always have that bug in you, man, do you miss it? Do you not miss it? And then I went on the road with the Imperials for two years and I said, forget this, man, I'm, I'm off this bus. And so uh, went back into the church, pastoring a church in Louisiana, New Orleans for 17 years, and then just came here to Kennedy Road for the last about three and a half years. Oh, that's amazing. So when you went to Pensacola, there was a time when they had a big, big revival. Were you part of that? Browns revival. No, we, we had just, it was probably a couple of years before that left and went to a different church. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> but you have an amazing experience. That's wonderful. All of you have amazing experiences. So I, I'd like you to tap back into your, when you were in the beginnings, in your smaller churches or... I guess, and Arthur, in your case, you were just in the theater. What are some of the, I guess, the, uh, the what were some of the, the, the challenges and what were some of the positive things that you learned when you were in your beginning stages of being in music and the arts at the very beginning? Any one of you. Arthur, oh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, well, I think one thing that is uh, sort of, always been a problem in the church over the years I've noticed is the relationship between church and artist um, you know and I've seen some artists over the years grow cynical of the church because mm. uh, I guess they're not appreciated or valued and uh, that's that's been a, a, a sad thing for me because mm. uh, I think that the arts can flourish within the church but there has to be understanding both ways you know and it's sad when you see Sometimes artists give up on the church, um, Christian artists, talented Christian artists. And at the same time, you see uh, churches that just don't have any appreciation for artists or don't see the value in what they're doing. So I always thought the, the, the most special churches I've been to have been these churches that celebrate the arts, that nurture their artists, that allow artists to experiment, to, to be part of the liturgy or the worship service and... Uh, I, uh, I, I just think it can be a beautiful thing and it can also be a very painful thing for a lot of artists. And um, so that, that, that has been a challenge that I've noticed over the years in ministry. That's a very real, real challenge. Um, and 
how has has that ever been addressed? Like, is there is there things in place to address those kind of challenges at this point, or do you feel that there's something that can be done even more? So, I don't know. I guess every context is different. Every church is different. You, you know, um, churches have a, any place where people are willing to, uh, you know, get to know each other, build, sit down, and understand one another, um, uh, take a chance on a new thing. I think you sometimes incredible things can can result in that. Um, um, but I think often, uh, or in, in the unfortunate situations, I guess churches just don't have, they don't think it's necessary, that they don't think it's a, a part of um, something that's important. Um, I, I often, you know, I often remember in, in the Old Testament, the, there's, a, there's a reference to the first person who's filled with the spirit. It was an artist. I think his name was Bezalel. I'm not sure I might be pronouncing it wrong, but it was, it was the dude who was supposed to like decorate the temple, right? When the temple was being built. It's like, it's kind of cool that the first person filled with the spirit that's mentioned in the Old Testament is someone who needed artistic craftsmanship. And, uh, and so I think there's definitely a role for the spirit and the artist. And, and, and it's when churches explore that, when they value that, I think incredibly cool things happen within the church and the community. That's awesome. Phil and Brian, what do you what are your thoughts on that? Uh, challenges and and the value of music and arts in the church. Okay. I've asked too many questions. <laughs> Phil, go ahead. <laughs> I'll jump in. Sure. Thank you. Well, I remember those first couple of years uh, struggling to find musicians in a small church. Uh, I think every worship leader in every small church in Canada uh, anywhere struggles with, man, if I just have one more drummer, if I could just, have, I remember Sundays where halfway through my opening song, the bass player would show up, smile as he walks past me and then plug in his guitar into his amp. And no one just thought it any differently. It was just kind of a small country church and, you know, case sera, sera. Um, but I was grateful for those friends. And this, the, the advantage that we had in being a small church is that we were very strong relationally. So, even though I was desperate for more drummers and bass players and everything else. Um, my wife and I chose to invest into the kids of the friends that we were growing up with. So we had 14 year old drummers and we had 13 year old bass players. Um, and we tried to shape the music that we did in our church within the framework of the skill level of the musicians that we had. So we didn't even attempt the big hill song songs back then because it was just beyond the scope of our ability. Well, boy, we would pull off simple versions of songs that were within our scope. And every Sunday we'd high five each other, we'd walk away and affirming one another. And that would keep us coming back the next week. And slowly we just saw the talent pool of our church rise a little bit. And that was more of the thing that worked for us. Wow, that is quite the experience. And yeah, I wanna come back to that because there is a question that, that has popped up already that, that uh, um, about using youth in, in ministry. So I'm coming back to you on that. Brian, I want to hear from you. <laughs> what are some challenges that you've seen? You get somebody and develop that talent within those guys. Um, it's, it, it's just seeing potential in people, speaking life into people. And I think it's also at the same time is getting musicians to see really where the heart, when I was a musician only, I really never saw the heart of the pastor because it was a gig. It, it was a job, it was a ministry, and I saw it as that. But I think sometimes where the conflict comes in is to, does the ministry see the heart of the, where the church is going and where the pastor is going? And in my earlier years, I didn't see that. And that's where the conflict came in. So in the early years is how do you get your musicians and your ministry people uh, to be not only involved on that stage, but involved in helping and serving and reaching out to the community. It's not just about your gift of music, but how can you, you do that, you know, reach out. Now all of the now all of you've experienced these and I'm glad you've shared this. And the reason why is because there are churches that some churches that do have don't have this problem, these issues, but there are still churches today that do. There are still churches today that are struggling with getting people to get involved or trying to glean from the you know 30 40 50 whatever number of people they have to get some talent to help them with for example their praise and worship teams what would you say to those churches that are that are still struggling at least to find the talent how can they attract that talent and and nurture them 
Well, I, I agree with what Phil said because uh, being when I was in a small church starting out in the Pol I was in a Polish an ethnic small church less than a hundred people, and uh, we had no option but to take kids you know 13, 14 year olds just like Phil was talking about and you you you're, they're basically six months into guitar lessons they're on the worship uh, team <laughs> like you know uh and and you work with like just exactly like he said like you'd pick material that they could play and uh, you'd work with them and the rehearsals would be about you know making sure everyone was kind of semi together and and i i think that that's a good place to start and um i i, I saw the fruit of that after a couple of years i mean some of those kids grew up to be uh quite quite accomplished, uh, maybe not, they might, they might not be musicians today, but they, they, they became quite competent at their instruments. And I'm, and I, I believe a lot of them are still serving on uh, worship teams. Right. That's amazing. You know, you, you bring that up and I think of our school systems right now. Um, before the, the COVID thing happened, um, I know my, my oldest son who's in middle school, the, the school district has actually made it mandatory for the kids to know music. And literally, it was such a, so, so strange for us to receive a letter saying, your kid's going to be taking music. It's not a choice. You're going to be taking it. So is he playing an instrument or is he learning history? Pick one. <laughs> literally is what we got. I don't know if all school districts are doing that, but I may, it begs the question for me. Can churches tap into that? Can, can churches and paraministries tap into those kind of programs and say, you know, if you're teaching, if you're forcing, not forcing, but strongly encouraging kids to learn, for example, music or, or drama or arts or dance, that the churches can kind of go, well, now we'll give them a, kind of an external incentive to, to further that. Like, they're, yes, the kids have to learn whatever they're taught in school, but can the churches tap into that a little bit more and say, hey, say since you're learning the clarinet, for example, why don't you come on board and do a clarinet piece for your church congregation? I mean, would that be something like, I, I, I'm not a pastor, so forgive me if I'm asking out of turn, but is that <laughs> something that churches can do, you know? <laughs> but I think young musicians attract other young musicians. I mean, you know, when we came to, Brown, uh, to Kennedy Road 19 years ago, uh, my drummer was a 13 year old little boy who is a phenomenal drummer today. His brother was a 14, 15 year old bass player. And so, but when I first came, it, it, it was it was different because we had nothing. I just mm -hmm. think you guys know people know people, and I think if somebody has a passion for it, I mean, we, we have a little kid right now in the youth department who's only been playing keyboards for maybe three or four months, but he's he's really good. He's he's got talent and ability, and I think if you just keep reinforcing it, because you want to see the future of the church. You want to you don't want to see the. It's not about the kids someday, it's the kids today. Like, how can we develop them to to worship with uh, the church? Uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier off mic, but we were talking about maybe some of the, the challenges that may be presented in your in your ministry. Um, what, what are some of the things that you've overcome? And you say, hey, you know what, if, if I could give you some word of advice um, pertaining to, let's say, um, um, band members, getting your, your crew, your, your worship team together, uh, what kind of advice would you give? Um, okay, well, um, for, for one, I'd say um, it's finding, one, one thing I think is helpful, small church, large church, it's putting the people with the higher level of talent in the proper place so that there's mentorship happening, uh, so that you raise the bar for what you're doing as a congregation. Um, yeah, I, I, saw, I saw this when I was out west for a while, uh, modeled so well. It was the, I was part of the Canadian Badlands Passion Play for a couple of months, which is a, a large passion play that happens in Drumheller in Alberta. And it's outdoors in an amphitheater. It's beautiful. And 90 some odd percent of the people involved in that are volunteers, you know. And, but there are professionals at the helm, you know, the directors, certain key actors. And, and they work with the people in such a way that the entire, not, the production didn't feel amateur. It, it, they, 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 they had people that were writers doing the writing. They had people in key, the key places where you need people who have been schooled, who have been trained, who have, been, uh, who have those talents. And, and so I find that um, sometimes exercising wisdom with, with where you place people in, in arts ministries within churches 
uh, has the potential to really make or break something and 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 elevate it and so so churches shouldn't be scared about using people who don't have the talent whether it's young kids or older people who don't but but utilizing them in such a way that um everyone feels involved and 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 you and you you you, you just bring about something beautiful uh, with what you have yeah yeah work with what you have that's definitely a good advice there how about brian no, I think it's excellent. It's just, you know, even if you have somebody who's not as good uh, performing or worshiping next to the guitar player, or the bass player, or, you know, it's, and it's even, we involve them sometimes in their, even in our practices to, to get those guys so that they're around guys and they mentor. You know, it's taken, I think if a guy really knows his stuff, he'd want to share it with someone else. So that we, we just feel like, you know, if you're that talented, because in musicians, you know, these days, they talk so highly about themselves, but that they won't spread it on to someone else. Um, and I think it just, you've got a great understanding of who you are in Christ, man. That's, that's, you want to like spreading the gospel. You want to, you want to build a mentor somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's right, for sure. And mentorship is so important. Worship and study. How do you carve out time for personal worship and study? Just got to make the time. It's like, you your, make it. <laughs> it's like your devotion life. You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's not all about just music. It's, it's about your relationship. Knowing God, have fellowship with God. It's the key. And that's what writes, you know, great writers of Church of the Highlands in the States, uh, Life Church, Elevation. I mean, it's, it's hours and hours and hours of, devotion which comes out you know god's spirit god's fruit of the spirit of uh and the words they say and it's just and it's not fluffy stuff it's it's really it's really the word that's right welcome back phil <laughs> we lost Thank you for a you. moment <laughs> that that is so embarrassing i feel like such a hack i'm sorry you just <laughs> no We'll just say that there was a, a thunderstorm somewhere in the prairies that cut me off or something. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Always the prairies. Blame it on the prairies. They're the inspiration and the cause. I love it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We're talking about developing um, your worship team here, Phil. If you have, okay. uh, you know, the, the, what type of techniques do you utilize to um, sure. maybe create bless and, and, and to generate new people? Sure, thank you. Well, again, I apologize for dropping out. A couple of things that have worked for me in the past, and some of it is would be considered by some to be outside the box. But uh, blessed are the desperate, for they shall try just about anything sometimes. Uh, I, I remember going to, like I said, the preteens of our church and trying that, and you know, we talked about that approach. I also went to the local high school and developed a relationship with the local music teacher uh, and would just offer Tim Horton's gift cards to students who, to be clear, were not Christians, but they were looking for playing experience, but they were friends with some of the kids in the youth group, and uh, that was just a way of pulling them in. And uh, this, this isn't a biblical proverb. This isn't capital P. This is lowercase p, but I've, I've really been guided by the sense that God has never demanded perfection, but he's always demanded our expected our best. And our best with the talent pool that we had at that time, we gave our best every week. It, it was not good, but we gave our best and we affirmed each other. And I would schedule the songs that we would sing a month ahead of time so that these young kids could practice all month long. And every month I would just try to raise the bar a little bit. If I raised it too far, they'd be discouraged. They'd want to give up and quit. But every once in a while it's, you know, hey, let, let's try this song. And they'd spend the whole month practice. And when people walked away from an affirming uh, experience, and parents would then come along and affirm the kids, and there was this love and affirmation, you just saw the body of Christ doing something that was pretty special. And a lot of those kids are still now they're adults and serving in ministry today. So that worked for us. It was amazing. Yeah. And that was a ministry to them as well. So that that's really 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 nice. Um, we were just, it's funny because I was thinking about all this uh, week bringing up to this point where I was thinking some churches might have a challenge with the whole professionalism of the, uh, the lights, the, the sound equipment, the, the, um, the, like we've got some session musicians in our band and things like that. You know, people might think that's all performance. That's not ministry. So 
how many times have you came to the point of that challenge that says, okay, I got to find a balance here? Or is, is, is that something that even is on your radar? Absolutely. If you're asking me, it, it's Everybody. a tension that we have had to fight and always have to fight. So I recognize that not everyone's going to agree with this statement, but I'll throw it out there anyhow. I believe every time we get on a stage, we are, it's a performance of worship. Uh, every time we tune our guitars and every time we test the microphone, we're doing so so that we can give our best performance to the glory of God. Okay, that's the perspective that I would take. And I would say we, we would do our best with our lighting. We do our best with our audio so that we can create an environment where we can encourage people to engage in worship. Now, we don't have the best microphones. We don't have the best lighting. We don't have the best instruments. We don't have the best singers. But we give the best that we have in hopes of encouraging people to engage in worship to the Lord. And we also want to create an environment for those who are not Christ followers, who are guests visiting our services, to go, surely God is in this place. Surely God is amongst you. And we use all the tools that are available to us to say, how can we use these tools to accomplish these goals? That would be the perspective that we would bring to worship ministry at our church. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Arthur, Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm grateful for my, I have a pastor who's uh, not afraid to uh, tell the worship team when he feels like it's performancy. I'm probably not the right word. It's not a word, but uh, you know, I, over the years that I've been uh, at the church I'm at now, you know, I've had a pastor who calls you out on it and, uh, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's, it's, if it's done in love and you know, where if, if it's, you know, that's, that's like the best thing you could hear. Uh, that he's doing you a favor. And so I think, um, you know, I think we got to be real about that kind of stuff. And um, all of us as artists can fall into moments or have this temptation where, where things can get a little showy, I think, uh, if we're real. And, um, you, you know, there's there's a way to keep that in check. And it's good, it's good to be able to be humble enough to receive to, to even be accountable and, and, and ask people to hold you accountable, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I love as a creator. Um, I love when I love the friends, the artist friends in my life who give me true feedback, you know, and, and, um, I, I know, because I just, over the years, it's, it's so refreshing when you think something's great, but then you're bouncing it off you and they're like, Oh, that's not, you know, it's, it's, that's a good thing. It's, 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 and we shouldn't be as artists, we shouldn't be afraid of that. We shouldn't be insulted. Uh, uh, iron sharpens iron. And, um, and, you know, I think if it's done in love, if you know, if, if it's not done to, to, to bring, to chop somebody down, but to, but to help them, then uh, we just have to create an atmosphere where we can in the church be free to tell, to, to, to encourage one another that way. Mm -hmm. that, that's true. I think that's healthy, right? It makes sense. Yeah, Brian. What about you? I love I love lights and smoke and all that stuff. I love it. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm all into it. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's just hey, listen. It's you are trying to you're trying to create an environment of your church, and when you get thousands of people in the building, and you you from your heart, you're not saying we're trying to put on performance, and I think. You know, the biggest thing for me is, do the people on that stage sit in, in the church views? Do they, do they, are they involved in ministry? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, uh, I think some of the people who've been judged the most as singers that I've had are some of the most sincere people. You know, like they are, they give up their life. They grew up in, they, people don't know it. They just look at the outside appearance and they judge it. But uh, grew up in the pastor as a dad, you know, the, the, Dad's a pastor of a church, super, super sincere. And, you know, as a pastor, you're always, you're all, you're cautious. You, you're cautious what you put in front of people. Um, and then it's just, it's the simple talks that you do with your, your singers. If, if you feel something, you just got, you got to address it. Yeah, very true. Now I, I was uh, looking at researching some other people that do similar things like you guys, um, but then I was looking, Don Mullen had some interesting comments. Um, he, he's a, a great uh, worship uh, writer, singer, songwriter. Don um, Mullen's watching. I just want to give a shout out. What's up, Don? Um, he, he might be, but his, his, <laughs> points were, his points were quite simple. He said, okay, in the first place, if you've got a small church, 
um, and you have one person who plays guitar, that's all you need. You don't have to go to other churches. I mean, that's okay if you have friends in other churches to help build your band. But if you have one person who can lead worship and communicate and minister while they're leading and draw the congregation into the worship, that's what matters. And, uh, and then they went on to say, you have a small band, you think the most important part, and you can, uh, you know, agree with this or, you know, chime, uh, chime in, but you have to have a leader, someone who's in a position of leadership of that small group. You, you can't let them all just kind of go like crazy and do whatever they want. So there's to be somebody kind of cohesively pulling them together. And the third point he made is, no matter which capacity, practice, practice, practice. So... <laughs> Look, look at online. I mean, you have worships that's being done by one person, two people, three people. You know, we can't, I think here, we only can use up to five. So it, it really doesn't matter about the number. It's just, it's when God moves, he can move through the simplest of things. Oh, it's, an, it's every band, every band needs a, a person in charge just to give it, you know, the bridles of where, where what are we trying to accomplish? What's the purpose of it? And where do we want to put inflections in the music instead of it just being all on the same level? Mm -hmm. But when does it come low? When does it come high? Everyone, everyone needs that leader. I can contribute one thought that um, uh, I stole. I, I'm, I'm stealing from Paul Belush. Uh, he is one of, I think, all of our worship leader heroes. And he likens a worship leader to being like a, like a host. Uh, if you were to come over to our house for a, a dinner party, a good host would welcome introduce everyone to each other, offer, you know, here's something to drink, which can I get you an hors d'oeuvre? And you're creating, and the word has been used several times in this interview already, but you're creating an environment that puts people at ease and lets them kind of know that it's a safe place uh, for dinner. And in worship, a worship leader, um, uh, help, a successful worship leader can provide that for the band and for the congregation going, this is a safe place. You can engage in worship. You don't have to be wondering who's in charge and where you're being led to. That's a good point. Good. Well, this kind of leads to, uh, sorry, Brian, were you gonna say something? No, so that's good. That's good, very good. Um, uh, this kind of leads to, to the kind of the question of investing, thinking of, uh, of kind of sort of leaning towards the, the leaders investing in the people. Um, I know you, you've said, a few of them, if you have said, you know, creating that environment where people feel safe. Um, and what are some, you know, just in case there are people who don't know how to do that, what are some tips that you can give in creating that kind of environment? People feel like it's safe for them to be a part of the, the, the creative arts or the, the music that you're being part of. What are some of the things that you can, that leaders can do in order to help ease people in? <laughs> I think, I think it's like anything with every small groups, it's, it's you get you get involved with them. Um, it's like we have small groups in the church, the band, all the bands are part of a small group. So they, they can be transparent, they can be open when they start creating music and writing music. Everybody has their, you know, they can give their two cents of what, what they would see happen, be creative. But I think it's the, I think it's a spiritual connection. It's just, you know, it's, the more you're with somebody, the more you know them, the more you're with them, you know, the more you know them, the more you trust them. You know, how do you trust people? You trust them. So. Yes, the relationship. I think you're hitting the nail on the head there. Absolutely. Uh, it, you can't just come in for a rehearsal once a week and feel like it's going to be a team, you know, because then you just got hard hands. But if you if you are connecting with them and really asking, you know, how are they as a leader? How are they doing? It? How's your spiritual life? Where are you? And it, it, especially if you have a connection with them, you're you're that person's brother, or that's your sister, and so you're concerned. You're not just so worried about how they perform or sing, but you're you're concerned about their eternity. Yeah, that's great because that that hits on a question that somebody was asking me about um, about their situation. They're, how do you deal with somebody who who working with them and you, they don't take what they're doing seriously because it is a voluntary position, and they don't they don't seem to have the same um, passion um, and and so as a leader you have to learn to try to relax and, and learn to to be with the person and, and get to the ultimate outcome of the goal you're trying to get at and relationship is an excellent way I think you're absolutely right can I just piggyback on that because Brian I think that's really well said and that's all part of pastoring the people that you're called to lead 
Um, I, I think that the musicians and the singers and the tech volunteers, they want to know that they're not a means towards our ends. Uh, they want to know that you're, you're, you're for them and you care about them. And I think that relational aspect is huge in pastoring people effectively. Uh, I also think that there's something to be said about giving them the tools to help them improve. Uh, so it's one thing just to love them, but if you're investing into them, whether it's buying them books, DVDs, YouTube links, um, different ways of saying, I don't just love you as a friend. I'm going to pour into you. I'm going to make you better. I'm going to help you succeed. Then they my guys don't that, want, uh, my guys don't want, my guys don't want books, Phil. They, they want uh, new guitars and new basses and stuff. They're, yeah. they're, these guys are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they want a new. They want the newest and latest keyboard now. <laughs> uh, if Don Mullen is still watching, maybe he can. Uh, stop yeah. with the Don Mullen stuff. <laughs> is Don Mullen still alive? Is he still alive? Okay, he's done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. my lord y'all bring up y'all bring up names that, that when i was a kid i re remember that stuff that was in the oh that's in the whole day is of ron cannoli wow wow maybe ron's watching too no no tag one and don let's <laughs> tag ron and don right now <laughs> um now just for a second i just wanted to remind everybody who was just logging on maybe didn't catch the beginning uh, we are talking about um, arts and, and music and ministry, and in this context, we're speaking about churches potentially and churches outside and church activities, parachurches, organizations, and such. And on our panelists today, we have Phil, uh, sorry, Phil Spolstra, and we have Brian Como and Arthur Wuchnick, and these guys are, are all pastors and ministers and been working in music and the arts for many, many years. Uh, if you have a question, please, we have a forum right here that you can ask those questions, and we can field some of those questions tonight as we go on. I'd like to go to the opposite end of the spectrum. We've talked a lot about from the very beginning, small churches kind of nurturing and mentoring with who you have. But there are some other churches that just have the philosophy of, you know what, we want the best music, because if we have the best music and the best actors or, or you know, best drama team, best dancers, um, then it'll attract more people to our church or I don't know, they have a whole different mentality and therefore they're willing to, to spend money and pay for the, their team, their music team, their tech team and so forth. Um, have you all or any of you experienced that kind of scenario and how did that seem to work out for the churches or the entities that were doing that? Brian? Go author, put yourself on the line, brother. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was just going to say that... Uh, Stick your neck on the line right here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, do, I do believe in compensating, compensating uh, artists. Uh, I think uh, we don't... We don't uh, most of the 98, 7% of the people we, um, we, we have involved with our productions are volunteers. Uh, but I absolutely believe that if, uh, if there's a Christian artist that makes their living... Uh, in the arts that if a, as a church if we have the means to to support that artist we should um i've i've i my my um thinking behind it has never been though in order to like uh you know to to attract people i guess i guess that's not really the the thinking behind it i i just believe that like i i value christian artists and i i always feel like if you're going to spend money as a church um especially in the context of productions Put the money into people and it will be better no matter what uh, le like yes you can put money into tech you can spend put money in a lot of different places in church but if you put it into talent and 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 I i'm not talking about uh, i'm talking about the people who have the right heart too you know when we've worked with people who uh are kind of the you know they don't have the right spirit they're you know uh they might be there one time and they're not back um but but so I, I know so many fantastic uh, Christian artists who have a real heart for God, who have a real passion and, and talent level. I 100% I, I believe that uh, we as a church need to be um, encouraging them and supporting them um, in their crafts. Wonderful, wonderful. Phil, did, have you ever experienced that on your end? 
Yeah, a couple ways. Uh, with the Vancouver Singing Christmas Tree, because it was for a window of two weekends and ten performances and dress rehearsals, um, we just were not going to be able to get a first violinist, first cellist, first trumpet player, and certain other musicians that were of the caliber of musicianship that we required to put on a production of that magnitude. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was an open understanding amongst all the volunteers that there were some hired guns brought in. And, and I felt that making it open and honest uh, uh, diffused a lot of the, the tensions that could come. And there are tensions that come in that. And a week-to-week -week Sunday to Sunday worship experience, uh, I have rarely had to hire out musicians. I've been able to beg, borrow, and steal from friends to come in if, if I've had to. I think a game changer, and forgive me if we've already talked about this when the storm cloud came over the prairies, but um, <laughs> multi-tracks has really changed the world for most worship leaders, big and small churches. Um, the church I'm at right now, we struggle to find electric guitar players. Um, and I'm just so grateful for the, for a few dollars, uh, I can buy these multi-tracks and it, we, we feather it in with our band sound and we, we, it supplements what we don't have. We're never going to have a Nord keyboard synth player. We're not going to have a lot of these things. So that is a tool that we have available that we didn't have even 15 years ago, at least for myself, that has been a game changer for me. I'll throw that up there. Wow. Yeah, that's true. Um, Arthur and Brian, do you use multi-tracks too? Or does your music teams use that? Or We, we use it as a supplement. I mean, everybody's using multi-tracks. Elevation uses it. Church of the Highland uses it. It just, it fills in the gap. It brings a fuller sound. You know, you, know, you use the, um, uh, some of the, the uh, ambient sounds before it, you know, when you're going into a song. So, and those guys got all that stuff got down but the majority i mean all the instruments that we play we they get those uh those instruments off the tracks okay. yeah we use it we use it from time to time um we uh we we actually as far as our worship team's concerned at the church uh dawson phyllis phillips is the pastor right now who is uh, the worship pastor um he we we we're fortunate that we've got quite a quite a amazing group of musicians to pick from right now so we don't have to go there uh to multi-track very often but but for sure there have uh like right now in this whole covid thing we have a wednesday night prayer meeting uh you know there's only a couple people in the church when we when we live stream that it's me on a guitar and dawson on the piano and we we started to incorporate multi-tracks just so it's not always you know just the two of us uh, it and it and it's nice i think for people watching at home to, to, at least for a song or two, to have uh, a little bit of a fuller sound. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of you write any, like, since we're on the topic of multitracks, two questions. One, do any of you write the music for your church? And if so, do you create the multitracks for them? When I was a music, when I was a music pastor, did, but they didn't have that at that time, but, but mm -hmm. no. Arthur, do you write it? Yeah, we, I mean, uh, when, when we, like, because most of the stuff I write now is theatrical, so, but when we do the orchestra, we've, we, we used to use a larger orchestra, uh, 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 the pit band was larger, but we just found that it was messier, and mm -hmm. so now we use a smaller band, and we, we, we the, the guy who does the orchestrations, Maurice, uh, who's also the conductor, he will create tracks to supplement. So we might have three horn players, but it sounds like there are, you know, 10. Uh, and we find that's, that's a very useful tool. So, and then, and then what's great about it is that we create tracks for rehearsal. And so the actors from day one, and usually the rehearsal process is about three months, the actors are working with exactly what they're gonna hear on the dress rehearsals and the show dates. So the right. dancing, the singing, it, it just, it's, it makes things so much easier. Cause I remember when I started there and you just didn't have the technology yet, uh, when the orchestra joined us, that first dress rehearsal was a nightmare because it didn't sound like anything with what you were rehearsing with. And I, I, you, you had maybe three or four tries with the band before it was showtime. And I remember as a performer, sometimes it was a nightmare. Like I, I, it wasn't until probably the third show into the weekend that I was feeling kind of semi-comfortable. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Arthur. That is true. That is very true. Um, I'm getting a, a few more questions here. Um, 
I don't know which one to pick first. Um, I think we've talked about one of them, which was, is there a place to have non-Christians in your worship and tech teams? I'm the guy that raised that. So I'll just be the one that recognizing that's a very controversial question. Uh, I have a full respect for people who would say, absolutely not. It profanes the holy. And I wouldn't even argue that point going, I understand. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I believe that there is room for opportunities to expose non-Christians to the presence of God. Um, I, where I would draw the line is I wouldn't want them on the front line in terms of being a worship leading singer, uh, but I would feel comfortable with a non-Christian who, from the position, he's not against us, but he's for us, yeah. playing, say, the bass guitar or helping mix the video mixer or something like that. And it may sound like I'm splitting hairs. And again, I understand who someone who's critical of what I'm saying right now would go, hold on, I get it. But I've wrestled with that over the 25 plus years of ministry. And those are the lines I'm prepared to cross. No, no, no. We all we all can agree that bass playing is not front line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm kidding. Oh man. I know you are. That's hilarious. <laughs> oh, uh, do you, uh, Brian and Arthur, have any other thoughts to add to that? I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to judge anyone for uh, doing that. We, we use non-Christians in certain areas of the production. I mean, we're talking about. Uh, of all, like that that weekend we used probably about 300 plus three to 400 people um but we have pretty strict guidelines with uh, like that word frontline i guess it depends what you consider frontline we we for instance and even in a small our smaller church i think we'd, we'd never use uh, a non-christian on the worship team but that's just our ch church i i i totally get why a church would though and i think it's one of those things where it's like like when paul's talking about you know, if you eat meat, whatever you do, just let it be under the Lord. Like, I, I believe that a person's, what drives a person to do that is really important. And I, I've seen non-Christians that have come to faith by being included in arts ministries in church. So uh, I think it's one of those things that you got to just do what the spirit leads and use wisdom. And, and it wouldn't be, you know, maybe hard and fast rules in this area. They're, they're gray, they're murky places. You know, it, it would depend on the, the, the kind of person that it is. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's a, that's a messy thing, but that's part of the messiness of church. Brian, as a pastor, what are your thoughts? Uh, I guess I have to say this. I'm not talking about the front line. I don't think I'd ever use him on the front. But the bass player who plays for our, our Calvin campus uh, was not a believer. Came because of the drummer, because the drummer is a part of our church. Uh, came to our church, uh, second service got saved next week. He brings his father to church, his whole family's in the church now. So that's who we're after. I'm not after churchy people. I, I want the lost. I want the people who would never darken the door. And if a bass player can come and during the service, uh, sit in a seat and be a part of us, connected with us, that's that's cool with me. I just don't want somebody coming in and playing and during the sermon, go out into the green room and just eat all the my uh, watermelon and uh cantaloupes <laughs> yeah, you can't have that Come on. that's that's off that's off bounds man <laughs> great, i think, I think you've got an interesting great. point there because some people would look at uh the band as being the ministers where there's a capacity there to be ministry uh so that's that that and i guess that would be up to you and what you felt is the the, the line there yeah okay one more question which i think is a really good one um, and I know there are, there are many good ones, but this one is, is um, I think is really good because we've encountered this a lot. Um, sometimes when we um, are in different locations, we encounter artists, musicians usually, that may be playing in a non, non-church or non-parachurch, non-ministry situations, but we find out that they came from the church. They found out they were probably you know, maybe leaders in the church, or maybe they were just, they were just in the front line. Um, but for whatever reason, they've been burnt. And I can't, I don't know why, I, I can't tell you what the reasons were. There could be various reasons. But what would you say to a, a musician, drama person, dance person, whoever, if they've been in creative arts in the church before, and for whatever reason they were burnt and they wanted to turn away, what would you say to bring them back in? 
Um, yeah, what would you say to bring them back in or to encourage them, re-encourage them? <laughs> go, Phil. <laughs> I love Brian. Go, Phil. Go. <laughs> All right, so I'm the sacrificial lamb on this one, am I, Brian? <laughs> just doing my pastoral duty. I'm just, uh, I'm uh, throwing it off. I'll tell you what. The delegation. Yeah. I would simply apologize and simply say, I'm so sorry for your pain. Uh, I don't know that I'd go even much further than that unless they invited me into a conversation mm -hmm. about their pain uh, or if they even wanted to have a relationship with me beyond that. Uh, because I wouldn't want to add to their pain by offering some sort of pithy, trite uh, platitudes uh, mm -hmm. that seem to gloss over their pain. So hopefully, if I were to be a voice of encouragement to them to come back to the church or to the Lord, as the case would be, uh, it would be an authentic relationship that saw that I just love them for being them. Uh, so I would just start with an apology, uh, empathizing with that, and see where they took it next. Maybe that's too simplistic. Brian, over to you. Oh, no, it's off this turn. Off this turn. <laughs> <laughs> Bill basically said everything I was going to say, so yeah. uh, I'm... Oh, man. No, I, the, the, thing that, the thing that came to my mind was just listening. That's the one The one where it, it, I, I, every situation like that is different, and it would begin with listening to that person and see where it goes from there, I think. Yeah. yeah. I just think I fate, I think musicians, sometimes we can be too touchy too feely and uh i would ask the question of, of what happened or or and i think you got to address it because you're trying to save that person from you know running away from god and you know it's i just i've been on both sides i've been in the artistry area and i've been a minister of music and now i'm a pastor and there's always there's always four or five different directions you go with that we can blame the church you can blame the pastor you can blame people but it all comes down to you is how did you deal with what had happened to you? Uh, how is your walk with Christ right now? There's always something that pulled me away or made me get frustrated. I mean, you leave a church, I leave a church in this church in Florida and go to another one. What's, what was the reason for? And then we can say the always the great reason is, you know, God, I felt the Lord say to me when really it wasn't the Lord. It was just your leading. You want to get out and go someplace else. And so, you know, I think once you, you, since you build a relationship with people, once they come on the worship team, you already know them before. And if somebody, I'll give you a good example. Our, uh, one of our players on our, our main team uh, was never playing that instrument because he was told by the team that was up there that he's not good enough. But it's just, you get to know a person, get to know a person, love them. He's like thinking, man, I just want to hear you play one day. Come on, just give me, give me what you got. And then you hear them play it and they're phenomenal, but they were just never given a chance. It's just mm -hmm. something stops people and it's usually people who stop people. Yeah. So if we, if we can encourage them to play and we know their hearts, it's, I love reconciliation, man. I love when people have been written off and uh, people come in their lives to write them back in. That's true. That's just, that's just my Louisiana bent. <laughs> Uh, it, it's uh, the people that are home right now that are listening or, or wherever they're watching the, some of them are probably in a place where they're saying oh I wish that I had a church that had a worship team that was what about that situation where there's no it doesn't seem to be a setup that's established or nothing really there what, what can they do I think, I think Brian's got a good answer on this one <laughs> <laughs> Nice one, Phil. I think my, I think my dog's barking right now. It's just causing a lot of, a lot of noise. yeah, man. Just I mean, you know, hey, listen. Here's what we say to people: if there is a ministry that you can be involved with, let us be a part of it. Whether it's mm -hmm. outreach, whether it's serving some capacity, if it's music, it's again, it's you're going to be in front of people and you're trying to lead people. Um, you just want to make sure that you know, guide them in the right direction. You want to make sure that it's good because if it's not pleasing, then it's going to turn people off. But I, you know, you're always, we're always really crying for, especially kids that are in the youth ministry, junior high ministry, get them playing instruments and know what they're doing so that they get to high school, they're still involved. Then they get to young adults, they're still involved. And then by the time they come to church, it's, it's big. But if you have, if you have nothing, 
you know, it's, I just think go to your pastor and just, and ask, just say, you know, multi-tracks is there for a reason. There's other things you can do. Uh, and just use, use all you got. And if you're totally desperate, you just put that Don Moen CD on. Oh my <laughs> Lord. If I hear uh, Don Moen one more time. You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> it's either that or uh, Leon Patillo. All right, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm going to get some bad emails. Oh, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other words of encouragement or advice that you'd want to give to church leaders that want to use, that, that want to or are thinking of using um, any form of music or creative arts in their ministries or in their overall big picture ministry? Martha, it's yours. <laughs> I'd say just do it. Just go and do yeah. it. Be bold. See? Be brave. He's got that. He's got that southern mentality. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I guess Phil, you'll be on the same page as that. You know, we got to wrap it up, guys. Um, this is uh, this has really been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed myself immensely. You guys have been a lot of fun to hang out with. This, this, uh, we are uh, just want to pray that you guys do well and 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 brave the storm here and get through this together and that we pray that after this is all over, you will be back to health and strength again as a church as it was prior and even better. Sure, I just wanna say thank you to Brian, Arthur and Phil for spending time with us today and sharing your experiences. It's a whole lot richer than uh, uh, I think anyone expected. I hope audience that you've gotten something out of this and I'm sure there's more. Um, I think, um, gentlemen, if there are more questions from the audience, is it okay if I send it to you so you, you can respond? Yes, they're all nodding yes. Okay. <laughs> Bill will take those. <laughs> Bill will take those. <laughs> okay. He's got the um, gift of delegation. That's what he's got. <laughs> That's what a pastor is, Pass right? It it on. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, um, for all of you who are watching, um, next week we are going to have another Hub Online again. Next week we're actually going to be talking about the business side of music. What are the do's and don'ts? What are the things that you need to be prepared for if you write a song or, or you're instrumentalist? So we will be talking about that next week. I hope you tune in. For now, I say thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to my co-host, Dale. And um, thank you for audience for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next week here on the hub live online